I am absolutely delighted to welcome my former colleague, Larry Bartels, and my current colleague, Theda Scotchpole. I will give you two sentences on each, mostly because what we, I want to do is get out of the way and let them talk, and probably everybody here knows uh, at least a little bit about both of them. Um, Professor Bartels is the Donald E. Stokes Professor of Public and International Affairs at Princeton. He's been there for many years. He directs the Center for the Study of Democratic Politics. Uh, his first book won the Woodrow Wilson Award from the American Political Science Association for the best book published that year in anything in political science. His most recent book is called Unequal Democracy, the Political Economy of the New Gilded Age, just published uh, this year by Princeton Press. It's a fabulous book. I'm in the process of writing review, so you have to be nice to me, Larry. Um, it's just a terrifically interesting book, and he's a terrifically interesting speaker. He's won more or less every award that political science offers. He's won more or less every fellowship that is offered to social scientists. I won't bother giving you the list, uh, but he's a really eminent scholar, and we're delighted to have him here. Uh, Theda Scotchpole, most of you know, so I will be even briefer about Theda. She's the Victor S. Thomas Professor of Government and Sociology at Harvard. Uh, she formerly was the Dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. She served as the director for the Center for American Political Studies, the president of the Social Science History Association, president of the American Political Science Association. Uh, she also has a long list of books, all of which have won at least one, and sometimes up to as many as five awards. Uh, she's also won every fellowship available to social scientists, so I could give you the same list, but I won't bother because it would sound the same as Larry Bartels. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to just introduce, uh, let Larry speak first, and then Theda will finish. They'll speak for 20 to 25 minutes, and I may or may not say a sentence or two if I'm inspired, but I will try not to, uh, on the assumption that lots of people in the audience will have lots of questions. And when we get to question time, let me remind you, please, to ask a relatively brief question with a genuine question mark at the end of it so our panelists can actually answer rather than hearing speeches from the audience. And they Thank should you. identify themselves. Please identify, yes. Uh, it would probably be useful if you stand and please identify your name and whatever affiliation you care to give us. All right. Thanks, Jennifer. It's a pleasure to be here, as always. Um, I noted that the title of our session today had one of those great causally ambiguous connectives that academics like so much, inequality and the election, which could mean the impact of inequality on the election could mean the impact of the election on inequality. As it happens, I'd like to talk a little bit about both of those things because I think they're important factors to think about working in both directions. Um, if you talk about inequality in connection with voting behavior, you're absolutely obligated to talk about the white working class, and so I'll begin by talking about the white working class. Um, you may have seen that the New York Times clear-cut yet another forest for this weekend's magazine, which had a long piece by Matt By. Can Obama close the deal with those white guys? So we need to know whether Obama can appeal to not just the white working class, but white working class males who are conservative in their social views, who live in southwestern Virginia and western Pennsylvania. And so people ask, you know, what's going to happen if Obama can't close the deal with these guys? The short answer is he'll be president anyway. But what I want to focus on, I think, is interesting about this election is that in spite of the manifold ways in which you would think that this would be an especially hard sell for Obama, he's actually doing, I think, remarkably well among this group by comparison with past Democratic presidents uh, or Democratic presidential candidates. Um, although there's a kind of image that in the good old days these uh, white working class people were voting overwhelmingly Democratic, by and large that hasn't been true. So for example, if you think back to 1952 and all the elections since 1952 and focus on whites without college degrees, since that's what many of the people who are writing in this literature like to think of as the white working class, um, there was exactly one election in which a substantial majority of those people voted Democratic. That was in 1964 for LBJ. Uh, John Kennedy won just about 50% of that group in 1960. Jimmy Carter won just about 50% of that group in 1976. Uh, Bill Clinton won just about 50% of that group when he won in 1992 and 1996. And I'm talking now about 50% of the, the major party popular vote. Uh, in the last couple of elections, uh, Gore and Kerry lost that group by something on the order of 15 or 20 percentage points. In the polls from this month that I saw from uh, CBS and the New York Times, Obama's current deficit in that group is 14%. Uh, and in the 
Gallup polls that I've seen, it's a little less than that, it's about 10%. So he's actually doing slightly better among that group than recent uh, Democratic presidential candidates have done. If you look at the subset of that group that consists of people with incomes below the national average, these are people who I would be more inclined to think of and talk about as the working class rather than people with above average incomes, the set of people with below average, in whites with below average incomes who don't have college degrees, uh, the margin is even closer, Obama's even closer uh, to being even with McCain among that group. He's, uh, I think, currently trailing by uh, about eight points in that set of people. Um, by comparison, if you want to know what a big demographic group margin looks like, um, white evangelicals at the moment, uh, at least, Obama's trailing by 52 points. <laughs> um, so it doesn't look to me as though the white working class is really uh, the key to this election in the way that you might think if you pay a lot of attention to popular commentary about the election. But insofar as it's important, along with lots of other groups, it's striking to me that Obama is doing pretty well among that group. Why is that, and why is Obama in the position that he's in with the electorate in generally uh, heading up to election day? Um, there are two arguments that I want to suggest that I talk about in much more detail in my book that Jennifer was good enough to mention, Unequal Democracy. Um, one is money, and the other is economic myopia, the sense to, in which people focus on how the country and especially how the economy is doing at the time of the election and use that to decide how they're going to vote, or at least that colors in some indirect way their decisions about who they're going to vote for. Those are both very strong effects historically. And I talk about them in my book because it turns out that both of them contribute greatly to the Republican Party's success in presidential elections over the past 60 years. Um, in a typical election year, the Republican candidate has a big spending advantage over the Democratic candidate. Before the Watergate financial reforms in the 1970s, Republican candidates typically spend about twice as much as since then, the parties have officially been uh, constrained in their spending by taking money, and so the presidential candidates have spent the same amount of money, but the Republican Party has typically spent a lot more, and independent groups have typically spent a lot more in support of Republican candidates than on the Democratic side. And so this has been a quite consistent Republican advantage, which has contr contributed to the Republican support. Myopia is another one that has favored Republican candidates for less straightforward reasons. The fact that voters are so focused on what happens in the year of the election rather than over an incumbent's entire administration turns out to work or has in the last 60 years worked heavily to the advantage of Republican candidates because of a kind of wacky uh, asymmetry in the pattern of economic growth in the two parties. The typical pattern under Democratic presidents is to have lots of income growth early in the administration, tailing off to election day, and to have a relatively weak economy during the election year. Under Republican presidents, the typical pattern is to have very slow growth, often a recession in the second year of Republican administration, and then increasing growth as the next election uh, comes around. And so although, on average, Democratic presidents are better for most people in terms of income growth. In presidential election years, Republican presidents are actually better for people in terms of income growth. And that translates into a substantial bias in performance in the elections. So those two things, by my calculation, uh, are the most important explanations for why Republican presidents have done as well as they have over the last 60 years or so. But neither of those factors is working in the Republicans' favor this time around, quite the opposite. Obama has a huge advantage over McCain in terms of fundraising, $150 million last month, more to come. He's now run out of places where he can buy advertising spots in swing states, and so he's having to spend money on national television ads, which we haven't seen in quite a long time, on ads stuck into video games and wherever else he can find places to spend money. And the state of the economy is obviously not working in favor of the incumbent party either. McCain has run his campaign largely on trying to distance himself from the Bush administration and from the current economic situation. But that's a very tough thing to do, and so far he hasn't been all that successful at it. So the two big factors that have historically worked to the advantage of the Republican Party are working in the opposite direction this time. Well, what is all of that advertising money that Obama's spending buying? 
I think in significant part what it's done is to neutralize what might otherwise be the Republican Party's main advantage or McCain's main advantage in terms of political issues, which in this environment I think would be the issue of taxation. Most of you have probably seen, oh wait, you live in Massachusetts, you probably haven't seen. Uh, most people in places whose votes are going to count in the election this year <laughs> have seen lots of ads by Obama explaining that he's going to lower people's taxes and that McCain wants you tax. Too, oh, you do get them. Okay, good. So you've seen these ads, uh, McCain's going to give tax breaks to businesses and to Exxon and all kinds of other bad people. Um, Insofar as that neutralizes the usual Republican advantage on the issue of taxation, I think it's going to be quite significant given that the economy and the issue of taxation is likely to be uh, weighing heavily on people's minds in the current economic context. Uh, so you might be alarmed by a poll that I saw, I, again I think this is a CBS New York Times poll, people were asked whether each candidate would be likely to raise taxes for people like you. Will Obama raise taxes uh, for people like you. Overall, 46% uh, of the respondents said yes, Obama would raise their taxes. 41% said no, he wouldn't. Um, among independents, 45% said yes, and only 36% said no. So a plurality of these people think that Obama is going to raise your, their taxes uh, in spite of all these ads that he's been running and the emphasis in the debates and speeches and so on, emphasizing the fact that he wants to cut taxes for most people. That sounds like pretty bad news until you turn to the parallel question for John McCain. Is John McCain going to raise taxes for people like you? 51% say yes, 38% say no. Among independents, 46 to 35. So exactly the same proportion of independents think McCain's going to raise their taxes as think Obama is going to raise their taxes. They're just generally suspicious uh, that politicians will raise their taxes. How is that going to affect their votes? Well, for those people at the margin, the independents and undecided people, I think it may actually have some effect. But one of the things you have to be aware of in these analyses of polls and indeed of election outcomes is the extent to which what people say about the issues is really just rationalization for decisions that they're going to make or have already made on other grounds. And so, for example, the partisan biases and these perceptions of the candidates' likelihood of raising taxes are quite interesting. Um, if you ask whether Obama's going to raise your taxes, 74% uh, of Republicans say yes, 26% of Democrats say yes, and 45% of independents. For McCain, 73% of Democrats say yes, 26% of Republicans say yes, and 46% of independents. So, in party, 73 or 74 percent, excuse me, out party, 73 or 74 percent, in party, 26 and 26 percent, and independents, 45 and 46 percent. It's like it doesn't matter who these guys are or what they say, people who are already supporting them are going to think well of them on this dimension. People who are already opposing them are going to think badly of them on this dimension. Okay, well what about what's actually going to happen to taxes or to the economy or to public policy more generally? Um, I'm of the school that elections make a big difference to the outcome of public policy. The most important factor in predicting how things are going to go over the next four years is whether the person who's sitting in the Oval Office has a little D next to his name or a little R next to his name. Um, I think most political scientists believe that this is important, but there's also a big camp of people who emphasize the importance of the preferences of ordinary citizens about important issues and the responsiveness of elected officials regardless of their party to the views of the public and shifts in the views of the public over time. So some of you may know the terrific book by Jim Stimson and his colleagues called The Macropolity, which emphasizes a lot the responsiveness of elected officials and of policy to shifts in public preferences. I think that work does a nice job of demonstrating that there is some responsiveness when citizens' preferences change, and from that point of view, I'll just mention that Jim Stimson's measure of liberal policy mood, which he's been tracking going back uh, over a period of about 50 years, as of the end of 2006, which I think is the most recent data that he's actually calibrated, these responses based on what people say to all sorts of policy questions about domestic policy in surveys. Uh, records the most liberal policy mood on record since the late 1960s. So insofar as this policy mood is consequential for policymaking in the new administration, that suggests that 
policy will shift significantly in a liberal direction. But there's a kind of dirty little secret in this analysis in the Macropolity book. The authors pay much less attention to a much bigger factor in accounting for shifts in policy because it doesn't fit as well in their story. That's the difference between having a Democratic president or a Republican president. And indeed, if you look at their actual analysis, it turns out that the difference in expected policy having a Democrat in the White House by comparison with having a Republican in the White House is greater than the difference between having the most liberal policy view on record over all the 50 years that they've been measuring and having the most conservative policy view on record over the entire period. You can see the same kind of pattern in the behavior of members of Congress. Uh, look at a Republican and a Democrat representing similar constituencies, or in the Senate, a Democrat and a Republican representing exactly the same constituents, the same state, and their behavior on a whole range of issues will be wildly divergent. The Republican will typically be way to the right of the constituency. The Democrat will typically be way to the left of the constituency. And so if Obama wins, and if the Democratic majority in Congress is strengthened somewhat, both of which I think are pretty likely, and if the policy mood is uh, more liberal than it has been for quite a long time, all of those things suggest that we'll see more in the way of liberal policy output than we have for quite a while. So there are responsiveness to public preferences, there's the pure partisan effect, and both of those will turn out to make big differences in terms of actual policy. What will the impact of those policies be on inequality? Well, the one that I focused on most is about the income distribution and patterns of income growth for people in different parts of the income distribution. I referred to this historical record of differences in performance under Democratic and Republican presidents. Um, for middle income families, the average level of real income growth under Democratic presidents is about twice as great as it is under Republican presidents over the last 60 years. And for working poor families, the average rate of real income growth is about six times as great under Democratic presidents as it is under Republican presidents. Well, how is it? What kinds of policies contribute? There are lots of them, uh, minimum wage regulations. Uh, but I was struck last week when the candidates announced their new and improved tax policies in response to yet another uh, lurch downward in the, the stock market to think about what those policies were and how they conformed with the traditional partisan impulses of Democrats and Republicans. I think in a way that many commentators haven't realized uh, Obama and McCain really are quite conventional representatives of their party's typical views. So what do they say they want to do uh, about taxes? Um, McCain last week announced a $52 billion plan which con consisted of $36 billion in tax breaks for senior citizens withdrawing funds from retirement accounts, $10 billion for reduction in the capital gains tax. Both of those are perks for investors mostly uh, relatively affluent people. He also proposed a suspension of taxes on unemployment benefits. That amounted to about one-eighth of the, the cost of the plan that he was proposing. And of course, he also wants to provide broader tax cuts for businesses and extend President Bush's tax cuts even for people with incomes over a quarter of a million dollars and so on. All of those are policies that have been quite traditional and quite conventional among Republicans, at least since the 1970s, the kind of trickle-down strategy of providing uh, tax breaks to corporations and to wealthy in, uh, individuals in hopes that that will, as McCain says, stop and reverse the rise of unemployment and create millions of new jobs. But the historical record is that that hasn't typically uh, created millions of new jobs. Indeed, the record of unemployment under Republican presidents has consistently been significantly worse than it has been under Democratic presidents. That's true whether you look at this period since the 1970s when Republicans have been pretty consistently in favor of supply side economics and trickle down. It's true if you look over the entire period uh, since the end of World War II. It's true if you compare, say, uh, what happened under George Bush with big tax cuts uh, for affluent people in 2001 and 2003 with what happened under Bill Clinton who raised taxes on rich people and expanded the earned income tax credit. In every case, the difference in unemployment between Republicans and Democrats amounts to a little over one percentage point. Um, 
What's the impact of a difference of one percentage point in unemployment? Well, if you look at how unemployment translates into changes in people's incomes, you see a striking asymmetry that corresponds very well with the striking asymmetry in income growth under the two parties, which is to say that unemployment doesn't make much difference to the incomes of people at the top of the income distribution. Their incomes are much more sensitive to changes in inflation, for example, which has been a kind of typical uh, Republican policy target. But for middle income people, uh, their income growth is quite sensitive to fluctuations in the unemployment rate. And proportionally speaking, working poor people's incomes are even more sensitive. But I did a little calculation, back of the envelope calculation, um, to think about what actually happens to middle class incomes when unemployment uh, changes. So imagine a one point difference in the unemployment rate sustained over an entire eight year period. So this is something a little smaller than the typical difference between a Republican and a Democratic president sustained over uh, two terms of a, a president's administration. Um, the cumulative impact of that difference on the income of a middle income family is about $10,000. Their incomes, total cumulative incomes at the end of that eight year period will be about $10,000 higher under a Democratic president because of this one policy difference or one difference in economic performance, the differences in unemployment. So this is one pretty substantial, but only one example of the ways in which the kinds of policies that the candidates adopt make a big difference to the income distribution, to the economic fortunes of ordinary people. Over the entire period that I studied in my book, this post-war period, uh, the difference between the two parties has amounted to a difference between some decrease in economic inequality under Democratic presidents and some increase under Republican presidents. But as you know, for lots of uh, reasons, uh, technological, demographic, and so on, um, there's been increasing external pressures toward economic inequality in the modern world, in the US and lots of other advanced industrial countries. Um, and so I think it's unlikely that even a democratic president with a democratic Congress and a liberal policy mood is likely to affect any real reduction in uh, income inequality in the next four years or the next eight years. But I do think what's at stake here is the difference between a continuation of the rapid increase in economic inequality that you might expect under a McCain administration and a kind of leveling off or a pause in the growth in inequality under a democratic administration. And so it seems to me that that's the policy implication of what's going to happen in just a couple of weeks. I might report, for those of you who are concerned that this was a partisan speech, that Larry says in the preface to his new book that the last time he voted was in 1984, and that was for Ronald Reagan. So this is a genuine social science analysis, not a partisan speech. OK, and on that note, I think I will um, um, acknowledge that I'm also going to provide a social science analysis, but there's really no point in pretending. Uh, <laughs> then I don't care deeply about the outcome of this election. So yeah, I, I interrupt you for one second. There are seats down here for those of you who are either standing or sitting in the back. There are seats in the front row and seats over here. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So I will be speaking as a social scientist, a historically oriented social scientist, but also as a citizen in, in, to some degree. Um, like Larry, I think this is a very important election, and uh, you know he has done a brilliant job in his book, and he did an even uh, more uh, succinct and cogent job today in in laying out some of the reasons why uh, this is a fork in the road election because of the clear differences in uh, partisan. Um, economic choices and uh, that, that, that are made. And that's, of course, magnified in the 2008 election because the way things are lining up, it may, uh, it's not just that a Democrat or a Republican will be elected president, but that um, it's very likely that if a Democrat is elected, he will be in power with um, much stronger majorities in both the House and the Senate. That's, that kind of lining up of change across the branches is pretty unusual. 
And I would go further and say that I think this is a, a once in a generation election of a milestone kind that uh, historians and social scientists will look back on long after all of us in this room are gone as a choice point in American history comparable to some of the elections leading into the Civil War, um, uh, the 1932 election, so and, and the 1968 election. Uh, so uh, we're living through an extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary moment in American political history. I think we rarely see such sharp divides in party message and in organizational strategies and coalitional strategies with um, marked um, and to some degree surprising implications for the way inequalities of race, gender, and class are going to play out, have played out, and, and might play out in the future. I'd like to talk a little bit, much more, um, uh, I don't disagree with hardly anything that Larry said except some of the comments at the very end that he made about how this will just be Clinton again holding the line on inequality rather than changing the trajectory. I will say something about what I think could be at stake after the election in a minute. But first let me talk about why uh, we should think about this election against the touchstones of 1968 and 1932. 1968 because, and the older people will join me in, in, in the room, will join me in remembering that that was an election where, once again, things could have gone very different ways in the United States. It was an election that took part in the aftermath or in the midst, of, depending on how you want to look at it, of the Civil Rights Revolution, which is one of the extraordinary uh, recompositions of the American electorate and, and a moving beyond some of the overt racial exclusions from the election, electorate that had been there for 100 years. And the issue in many ways was whether Democrats would manage to come off that period of upheaval by creating a new, um, uh, what Tom Edsel uh, called a kind of bottom to middle coalition that bridged the racial divide uh, that had been exacerbated, not just regionally, but within the North by the Civil Rights Revolution and its aftermath. There were also new tensions about the role of women, which, uh, and, and that's not just men versus women, but how we understand the role of women and uh, their obligations in the family versus their uh, presence in the, in the wage labor force. Um, so um, it was an election where it might have been possible, maybe you can argue, for Democrats to put together a certain kind of uh, bottom to middle cross-racial coalition that renewed and extended the tradition of using the federal government uh, uh, to actively expand opportunity and, and spread security, building beyond the policies in place that mainly benefited retirees and the families of retirees, uh, toward doing more for income and job security, uh, maybe universal health care, things that would have appealed to white and black alike. But that is, of course, not what happened. Uh, there were a series of events, including international events and terrible assassinations, uh, that opened the door uh, for um, 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 what now looks like a four-decade-long period of conservative ascendancy um, certainly fueled by an increasingly conservative Republican Party, although Richard Nixon in many ways was liberal, um, and many of the liberal policies went through under him. Uh, but uh, some of the political strategies that were put in place during the Nixon era would play out uh, in the future. And Democrats, and including the Carter presidency, I would argue, and the Clinton presidency, were uh, you know, adjusting the trajectory within uh, a move toward a more conservative understanding of politics and skepticism about what the federal government could do for average citizens. And certainly this has been a period in which racial politics and racial divisions have been played in our political process very, very overtly. Um, and um, although I understand and I accept what Larry Bartels has, has documented about lower income whites, although he does say in his book, Outside the South, and that's a pretty big you know, outside the South, but um, I, I think in many ways we have to think about politics in the American system as two omnibus parties trying to put together very diverse coalitions, each one of them, 
that bridge the different, very different political cultures of the states in a federated electoral system, and uh, that um, have to build, in the case of the Democrats, from bottom to the middle, and really pretty far into the middle to get a majority, and Republicans, on the other hand, trying to put together a top to middle uh, um, appeals and coalitions. And uh, the Democrats have had a very hard time in this entire period of the last half century doing that, partly because their task in elections, uh, presidential elections, has been to bridge the political cultures of the coastal states the Massachusetts, the New Yorks, and the Californians on the one hand, in which their coalition was, is kind of anchored in increasingly in, in educated professional uh, populations and minorities, racial minorities, and putting that together with something that looks more like a New Deal coalition of sort of working class Catholics and some rural uh, populations in the Midwest. Well, they haven't done that very well, and, and we know that, and they still may not do it in this election. I think there's a good chance that Ohio will, will, not, will not be uh, in the Democratic column. Um, so um, I guess what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the challenges of the Democrats and Republicans in putting together these coalitions and why that has suddenly changed so remarkably in the last uh, two elections leading into this one. Because uh, what's happening in this election certainly is heavily impacted by the profound failures of policy as understood by the majority of the American population. Now, I'm not talking in a partisan way here. In both the foreign policy realm and the domestic policy realm, and the sharpness of the perceptions of that failure because of the economic meltdown that occurred. And you might say that's all that matters, and maybe it is. But I also think that we need to look at parties as organizations, as coalition builders, as carriers of messages that they either get together or don't get together going into elections. And the Democratic Party in particular is capable of not getting it together uh, uh, going into an election. And there's nothing that says that they did have to get it together going into this one. I don't think there's anything that says that McCain and the Republican Party had to get it not together as much as they have gotten it not together uh, uh, going into uh, the, the next, uh, the, what's going to happen in two weeks. So let me say just a little bit about the near-term things that I think have happened, have kind of come together in to create an election which dramatizes differences about the role of government in American democracy at home and at broad, abroad and clearly presents class-based choices. It's rare to see politicians talking as frankly, not Republicans, but Democrats, talking as frankly as they do about distributional issues as in this election. And, you know, many people may have thought Obama was out of his mind uh, to, to do what he's been doing, but he's been doing it pretty, pretty consistently. So what are some of the short-term things that have come together, and how do they speak to the changing role of inequalities and the way they've lined up in this particular election? And then I'll say something about what comes afterwards, perhaps. I think that the, the sequence of events from 2004 to 2006 was pretty important because they tended to shift the balance within the Democratic Party toward anti-war liberals. Now, that was a first step that was important, not because it's dominating the agenda in this election, who's even talking about Iraq anymore or about the war, but because it made a change inside the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party, in addition to having to struggle with racial divisions and regional complexities over the last uh, four decades, was having a hard time getting any kind of populist, economic populist message consistently out there because like the Republican Party, maybe even more so for quite a while, it was influenced by big money politics. The way in which money was raised for increasingly expensive elections and the way in which messages were disseminated in American civil society through the parties and through advocacy groups was extremely money driven. And that pushed in the direction for the Democrats of having to choose between their upper middle class, their 
what what's that lady Rothschild's first name? Those kinds of people. Um, um, uh, the the one who thinks Obama's too arrogant. Uh, the Baroness, yes. Uh, having to put having to choose between you know favoring the sort of advocate uh, lifestyle advocacy liberalism that they wanted, which actually often went with quite conservative ideas about what the government should do in the economy, and uh, the preferences of the dwindling, decreasingly effective labor unions. Uh, and not to mention the, the, the uh, civil rights groups, which I think by the 70s and 80s had lost their populist roots uh, and were, were promoting uh, more affirmative action regulation than kind of class-based policies that would appeal to actual masses of working class blacks. So uh, Democrats really were in a bind. They were raising money from people who weren't really prepared to support necessarily, even, even more than the Republicans, raising money from folks that weren't prepared to support a broad class-oriented message or activist government on behalf of uh, redistribution, even mild redistribution. What the aftermath of 2001, the victory of Bush over Kerry in 2004, followed by the increasing anger of the anti-war left in the Democratic Party did, was to spur a process of innovation in fundraising that at first sputtered under Dean, but laid the basis for the brilliant synthesis that the Obama campaign has created in this in this election cycle. A synthesis of new technology with grassroots person-to-person -person contacting that replicates the very best of American federated civic action in a way that conservatives did through the, through the pro-life and pro-gun movements in the 80s and 90s. Finally, this came to the Democratic side. That had huge consequences in this election because it, it made the Baroness de Rothschild and her friends less relevant uh, in setting the agenda in the Democratic Party. Now, we saw that drama play out in the, in the primaries. Um, on the one hand, Hillary Clinton's candidacy was an extraordinary breakthrough on a dimension of inequality we haven't talked about yet, gender. She was a serious contender for the presidency uh, for the first time, and, but at the same time, she was married to Bill Clinton, and the Clintons uh, were tied to that old form of resource mobilization and uh, agenda setting in the Democratic Party. And it probably was pretty important that that lost to lay the basis for the shift that Obama made after winning the primaries toward marrying that kind of anti-war liberal new money raising machine to an economic populist message. You know, you may have noticed he pivoted to Hillary Clinton's message, and he hasn't stopped. He every day he says that. So he married two things that might not have gone together, and that I think haven't gone together in previous internal uh, Democratic Party struggles. Uh, now I want to be careful. I don't want to suggest that the new fundraising machine behind Obama is somehow mass democracy. I don't think so. We don't have any studies yet showing. Uh, who these people are that are giving, but I suspect they're folks like all of us in this room. In other words, what's happened is that fundraising has moved away from the very biggest money interests toward the upper middle class liberals who are voting to tax themselves more. Um, it's an extraordinary uh, phenomenon, but it does spread out the fundraising base and uh, uh, leads to less dependence. Uh, he, he has to spend less time in fundraisers, and we know that when Democrats go to fundraisers, things go very, very wrong. Um, but, uh, so, and, and, and he also has a machine he can go back to again and again to raise the amounts of money that have made a big difference. Larry's right. In this election cycle, this is extraordinary. Democrats can swamp all of the modes of communication. I think it is also important that that's been married to a kind of personal contacting thing, which definitely comes out of the sort of organizing tradition that Obama understood and that they've brought to this uh, in a way that had been there only on the right in the previous uh, cycles. In the previous cycles, 
uh, the Republicans had used that through their Christian uh, conservative networks. So, um, all of that happens, and then it ends up being married to an event, a focusing event, the Wall Street meltdown, which probably was very important, I think Larry was arguing this and I would agree, in breaking that cycle of not being able to quite see the economic consequences that has often been there in previous. I'm not sure if that hadn't happened, I still think middle and working class Americans might have been aware that the economy uh, hasn't been working for them and that message has been driven much more effectively. But if there was any doubt about it, that doubt uh, went out the window uh, when the crisis hit. Now, let me just conclude with a few comments. How is race played in this? I've been talking about that. But if you look back over 40 years, this is a mind-boggling event. An African-American with the middle name of Hussein is on the verge of being elected president of the United States with quite a lot of white working and middle class support. I mean, how many people here in the room, raise your hand, thought they would live to see that? Yeah, not too likely. Um, I think that we have to acknowledge the fact that his biracial background and the very consistent presentation of the white relatives who raised him has been part of what has made this possible. And even at the earlier stage, the fact that his black father was an immigrant or a, a foreign student and actually, um, made, made it easier to present him as a bridge builder in a society that is increasingly racially and ethnically diverse, not just black-white, but post-1965 immigrants. So this is extraordinary, but partly because of the ambiguity of Barack Obama. And that ambiguity was also the key to the enthusiasm that young people showed for him, which was very important in kicking him off at the <coughs> uh, in, into, into his run. So this is a, an election that is finally, perhaps, going to lay to rest, or at least mitigate, the racial demons that have been there overtly in American politics for 40 years, but it took an ambiguous figure uh, to do that, running a campaign that has been brilliant, absolutely brilliant, in allowing people to become comfortable with him. Um, and I don't think we could have taken that for granted. It points to the uniqueness of the candidate and the extraordinary strategy uh, behind him. Gender, I've already talked about. I think we're going to look back at this as an election that was a breakthrough on issues of female equality and also a farce on issues of female equality because we saw uh, that Hillary Rodham Clinton was both helped and hurt by her marriage, and that means that marriage continues to be um, a, a, a very overt issue for a woman politician. And Sarah Palin, you know, reminds me of that cartoon that appeared in the New Yorker some years back with two white uh, corporate chieftains walking down the hall. One looks at the other and says, my ambition is to have a board that looks like America and thinks like us. <laughs> now, the thinking like us is um, conservative populism. And that conservative populism does have an egalitarian side to it. So I don't want to deny that. Um, and I think that she very much was picked to appeal to that uh, egalitarian side. But the irony is that she has ended up being a polarizing figure among women, more among women than among men. And that reminds us that some of the divisions between women that Kristen Luker, for example, wrote about in her brilliant book on abortion, that abortion divides women, uh, who are thinking about their life choices and their values in different ways. I think these, these issues continue to reverberate in this election. So in a way, the frontiers of gender equality have another uh, round to go through. 
And then on class, I just want to close by saying that I think what comes after this election is extraordinarily important. Um, the stars are aligning if Barack Obama wins as big a victory along with Democrats as I think is likely in two weeks for the Democrats to have a chance to redefine the role of the federal government for a generation, to redefine it as something that is on the side of people in the middle and aspiring to be in the middle. And we haven't really seen anything like that since the 1930s. That's what was accomplished in the 1930s. All the stars are aligned for this to happen because of the partisan lineup, because of the fact that this is a re what Stephen Skoranek would call a repudiating election. Obama will, he's not going to be Bill Clinton kind of sneaking in there over the plurality. He may be coming in with a big majority against the backdrop of a regime defined as failing. Um, and he has those qualities that enable him to build a, a cross-racial and cross-ethnic uh, coalitions. But it'll all come to naught. I hate to be, my husband and son say I'm a Cassandra. I hate to be a Cassandra. It'll all come to naught if he and the Democrats can't find responsible and effective ways in the midst of a blizzard of New York Times and Washington Post editorials telling them to balance the budget. That's what we're going to hear. So, and suddenly Republicans will become fiscally responsible. Um, that will that'll happen. It's already happening. If they can't find a way to both make the crisis management in the current crisis and the payoffs in the first four years seem like things that are viscerally, viscerally relevant to opportunity and security for average families. They've got to find a way to take some action finally on the health care costs and health care access. They've got to find a way to reverse some of the growing inequalities in access to college and post high school education. And they certainly got to visibly, not with sneaky tax things, but visibly uh, enhance employment, including employment in places, because America is ultimately a set of geographies, places that have been neglected by Democrats and Republicans alike in the last 30 to 40 years. That's a tall order when, you know, hundreds of billions are being hand out, handed out to Wall Street. So. Will they be able to do it? They've got to, and they've got to show a sense of strategy. But I'm unguardedly optimistic because if Barack Obama is elected, one other thing that he is, besides being racially ambiguous in, in extraordinary ways and uh, uh, willing to marry a new style of politics to an economic populist message, the other thing he is is a remarkably strategic thinker. He is somebody who I don't think you want to tangle with but he does it quietly and with a smile, and he thinks more than about tomorrow. That makes him very un-Clinton, and it makes it possible, not necessary, but possible, that he could change the trajectory of inequality, not just hold down the rise of inequality uh, uh, for the next period in American history. Scotch Fool is not a partisan speaker here, uh, although obviously I admitted it right. Yes, yeah, she said it at the beginning. Uh, so I want to take the prerogative of the chair and ask both of you a question to start with, and this is a sort of a political science wonky kind of question, um, which is to say that Theda, you talked a lot about the uniqueness of the candidate, the racial ambiguity, the particular con financial configuration, the strategic brilliance, and so on and so forth. Uh, you said I think nothing about the candidates as personified individuals, right? I mean, one's Republican, one's Democrat, they're in a particular. Uh, conversely, you talked a lot about sort of implicitly a set of models that have extended from the 1950s up through the present, and so we need to think about how those models are appropriate to this election. Uh, you didn't do that, Theda. So I guess what I want to ask each of you to say something about whether we should think about either con on the one hand the uniqueness of the candidate or candidates, and on the other hand a sort of a long-term set of uh, variables that affect elections more or less independently of the candidate. So each of you to think about sort of the position that the other of you tends to start with, if you would start there. And then we'll open the floor to questions uh, from the audience. Yeah, um, 
I think Obama has run a remarkably good campaign. I think McCain has, in some ways at least, run a remarkably bad campaign. But I guess I would say that it's difficult to sort those factors out and separate them analytically from the context in which they find themselves. I think Obama has been good in part by recognizing, even when the short-term tactical situation looked bleak, that he was in a advantageous strategic position in this election cycle. And conversely, I think McCain has been quite sensitive to the fact that he was starting out in a big hole and that whatever he did was going to have to shake things up somehow. So he's made a series of decisions that I would say were probably not unreasonable as um, kind of off chances of shaking things up sufficiently to win, but that in terms of the expected impact on the vote, we're going to be likely to make him do worse rather than better. So um, I would say that their behavior has been structured by the strategic situation in important ways. Do you want to say anything about that? Well, I, I mostly agree with that, but of course I was trying to talk about the additional factors that may make it possible for this to be a pivotal election and not simply a partisan switch. The one thing I, w I didn't have a chance to say that I actually think McCain has made strategically puzzling decisions that did not maximize the possibilities. And um, I think it may be a testament to something that um, historical institutionalists like myself are pretty sensitive to. In a way, McCain, although he is a very unusual Republican, and therefore p appeared to be the strongest possible general election candidate that the Republicans could put up in a weird year, in a very difficult year for them, he chose to double down on the Bush economic policies, even as he was going into an election that he should have known was going to be economically stressful. And he hasn't offered much of an economic message until Joe the plum plumber. And uh, Joe is kind of late and not entirely a helpful. Plumber. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> plumber. <laughs> so I am a no, little surprised. And I think that you have to understand the choices he made as, first of all, a guess about the role that national security policy might play in this that proved to be wrong for reasons that you can forgive him for being wrong about. He probably had reason to think that he might have advantages there that have turned out not to be very salient or very uh, reinforced by events in Iraq. But on the on the on the economic front, I and the and the sort of how he's he's chosen to run a base election, a base mobilizing election. And the Palin choice was a base mobilizing choice. Um, he, he, I think, has been amazingly constrained by the degree of popular mobilization that has occurred in the Republican Party. Um, the desire to activate that popular enthusiasm, yet again, and I guess, you know, I think Bill Kristol sold him on the idea that Sarah Palin would be perfect for appealing to the middle as well as, in, in that sense, gender really, you know, he, he I thought a woman is a woman, and women are going to like a woman. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he, didn't, he didn't realize that a lot of women were going to be insulted by this choice. Uh, but he may not have known her. Uh, and so in, you could say that gender stereotypes help to uh, undo the guy. I mean, I just thought of that right now. And that's supremely ironic, uh, because he probably thought he had somebody who could appeal to those independent women in the middle. and. He he ended up having somebody who's really bad that turned them off. Um, so I, I do think those choices have been important, though, because in a way they've cleared the way for an election that isn't just Tweedledum and Tweedledee. This could actually change the way people understand the possibilities of uh, government in America in a way that might not have played out that way, even if Obama had eked through to a victory. Um, all right, your turn now. Um, obviously, lots of people are going to want the questions. Professor Wilson, would you identify yourself, please? Bill no. <laughs> right, uh, Wilson, uh, sociology department, uh, African American American Citizens Kennedy School. And everywhere else. <laughs> right. Uh, no one said anything about uh, the role of black voters. And I'm not just talking about the mobilization. 
Just underline, I'll let Larry jump in, but just to underline that, we know that blacks didn't buy into Obama until after he showed he could win white votes. That's what's so interesting. I mean, they weren't, they weren't going to go down that road. Uh, it was only after uh, some white folks voted for him that they said, okay. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let me point out that there's some seats over here uh, in the front and over on this side for those of you standing and sitting in the back. Um, yes. You. Uh, my name is Forrest. I'm a student at Kennedy School. And I would just like to welcome you. Um, I'm kind of curious, what happens to the Republican Party after this election? If, considering if McCain loses and if, as looks likely, the Democrats take up seats in both houses, um, do you think the Republicans will, as you said, double down on their conservatism, or do you think they'll find some, at least as sort of a veneer of moderation, <laughs> like uh, David Cameron? Yes, sir. I did a radio interview right after the 2004 election when everybody wanted to talk about whether the Democratic Party was about to become extinct. <laughs> and I said the only thing the Democratic Party needed to get back into power was four more years of George W. Bush. <laughs> and I think that was interpreted as a partisan comment, but it wasn't really meant as a partisan comment, but rather as an underlining of a really strong trend that you see in electoral politics, which is that uh, the longer a party is in power, the harder it is to stay in power. And the longer a party is out of power, the more desperate they are to get back in. And the longer they're out, the more willing they are to make all kinds of accommodations in order to get back into power. And so I'm not sure that four years in an Obama administration would be all the Republican Party needs, but I'd be willing to bet that as a Democratic administration goes on, even if it's pretty successful in the way of policy, the issues that drove it to power will begin to recede. Uh, the A team that looks so competent at this point will get burned out or begin to look less competent. And on the other hand, the Republicans will be sorting through their set of personalities and issues to be able to try and find some way to put together this remarkably difficult, as Tita mentioned in her comments, to build a majority in this country is a very difficult thing. And so it's not surprising that no majority tends to last very long. And as soon as you lose one, you go about trying to build the next one. I mean, I agree with that. I think it may be a while. And I mean, um, I can remember back to 1964, actually. I mean, I was just a child, but I mean, I, I, I remember uh, the, uh, the uh, yeah, actually wasn't a child when Bill Ayers. <laughs> 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 but I didn't support him. No, uh, uh, I can definitely remember when people thought the Republican Party was going to totally disappear. And, you know, we saw where that. Uh, but realistically, when parties lose as badly as the Republicans might, and I want to say might in two weeks, two weeks is an eternity, they do go through a period of internal um, warfare. And, uh, you know, I think we've seen already the opening shots in that, in, in that warfare. I mean, who is to blame for things is already being discussed. And Colin Powell's remarks were quite remarkable. And they were not as only remarkable for what he said about Barack Obama, but for what he said about the Republican Party. And um, there will be a fight <coughs> among um, the fiscal conservatives, the more libertarian, and the populist uh, evangelicals who are the sets that make up the coalition. Now, that said, even if they win, and maybe even especially if they win, the Democrats will all, the Democrats are not, never a united party. And uh, a lot of their moderates are gonna come back in. So they're gonna face all kinds of issues about how to put together 
they're going to, their, their problem is going to be to find a way to make policy choices that bridge the executive and the, and the congressional branches and build popular support rather than sacrificing it and, biz, and, and business acceptance. And that's not a small thing, so it's going to be very crucial which policies they choose, how they choose to go about it, and in what sequence. And they're also going to have to have a certain amount of luck because external events can take things one way or the other. So uh, it's always a struggle for both parties, but I think that the Republicans are in for a period of uh, internal knife fights for quite a while before they settle on what the next round is. It's so striking that in this election, all of the xenophobic and racial imageries have been trotted out, and they don't seem to be working. Um, and that is surprising in a way, but they don't seem to be working. And so gonna have to go, they're going to have to go to plan B or plan C, and I don't think they're going to agree on what that is. Short question. There's, just there's still quick a question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, okay, I mean, there, there's maybe too much there to shorten it to your satisfaction. I don't think that Obama is a flaming liberal. I mean, I know that's what the ads say, uh, but um, this guy is a fairly um, center left, moderate Democrat. He's going to make a series of pra pragmatic decisions many of which are going to be quite upsetting to the Democratic Party's leftist constituencies. Uh, but if the central question is, is he going to look for a way to use government to convey the message to what I called in my book the missing middle, that is, people who are not elderly, who aren't poor, who are in the sort of lower middle, upper lower part of the income distribution, is he going to try to find a way to deliver some benefits to them so that they gain some faith and trust that government can matter. I think he is going to try to do that. He's, he's, I don't think that was evident in the primary, but I think it's become evident since then that he understands the importance of doing that. Um, so he's going to try. And I think he'll probably have more cooperation from the Democrats in Congress than you, certainly more than Bill Clinton had. Bill Clinton didn't have any help from the Democratic barons in the Congress. This time around, I think Democrats are not the same, and they also understand that they could be in a precarious position. So I think they will cooperate more than uh, many of the pundits believe. He's going to try, but it's going to be a difficult political context and social context in which to try and operate. I mean, to hark back to the analogy to 1932, people like to think about, you know, we had this terrible economic crisis and Roosevelt came in and things were better. Yeah, um, but uh, if you look at the pattern of voting in 1936, it was heavily sensitive to where in the country people's incomes were growing in 1936. So uh, Roosevelt presided over an increase of about 30% in real incomes in 1934 and 1935. And as best I can tell, at least, that had no impact at all on his vote in 1936. And so he did well in the places where the economy was growing in 1936. And if the recession of 1938 had happened in 1936, FDR probably would have been a one-term president.
I don't have a good sense of the specific contributions of either the tax cut or the war to the current economic situation, although I think they've both been detrimental. Uh, I would mention, though, that there was a economic stimulus package that was passed in the spring with lots of cooperation by the Democrats for reasons that aren't entirely clear to me, which produced a huge bump in real income growth in the second quarter of the election year. Um, that has had so little uh, effect even over the range of the rest of the year that I don't think it's going to turn out to be decisive. But that's the sense in which voters are likely to be quite sensitive to these short-term factors. I think what the Wall Street meltdown did mostly was just to focus voters' minds on the economy and how the country is doing in an even more dramatic way than would have happened otherwise. But I think it probably would have happened otherwise to a significant degree. There's a pretty regular tendency to observe in patterns of polls moving over the course of an election year that the candidate who's advantaged by the economic state of the country increases his advantage as we get closer to election day and people begin to focus on that uh, more than on the other things that the candidates are talking about, but especially this year. Although I really do think this meltdown as a focusing event was pretty damn important because it is true that the Republicans were doing the same old things to create that boost. And social security checks too. Um, so, um, you know, I actually think Obama's going to prove uh, the wisdom of, of that book that Bill Wilson wrote long ago, called The Declining Significance of Race. Um, and the title perhaps wasn't quite the right title uh, way back then, but uh, the argument that a politics that um, delivers benefits to uh, workers and families of color, and we have to remember that there are many Latinos in play here, and the Latinos who remember back in the primary they weren't going to vote for Obama, and then they just moved en masse, uh, and I think for economic reasons as much as anything. I mean, I just think that this is going to be a, a presidency where, which is going to make a difference in the way race is understood in America because it's going to consistently talk about what we have, what we need together. I mean, he's done that consistently. I expect he'll continue to do it. And he'll try to find a way to deliver benefits that are for white working class and lower middle class people along with um, the large numbers of people of color who are in those same strata who will benefit disproportionately. And, you know, we've seen in the last stages of this campaign, I mean, the, the final, the economic message that McCain finally arrived at last week was an attempt to play that card. I mean, the argument, for example, that you're going to take tax money from Joe, uh, that small businessman, non plumber, and, and, and give it to people who don't pay taxes. That was an attempt to replay the, 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 uh, the, the various tactics that divided kind of lower middle income people from racial minorities in the past. But it's harder to do that because welfare was changed in a way that makes it not so salient an issue. People are aware probably that they pay payroll taxes. And the whole issue of job security and just kind of access to sufficient income to pay rising costs is very salient. And that's been hit on very consistently. I expect Obama will continue to do that. I think, uh, ironically, his presidency will cause a lot of conservatives to say, well, the blacks have been taken care of. There are no more race problems in this country. And that may, may create some issues. Um, but it'll change the style of politics, It'll, I think. Uh, unless he's not successful at all, it will de-racialize uh, a lot of distributional politics in this country, um, while at the same time enabling government to deliver a lot more to, to people of color who have a disproportionate stake in that. So that, and, and to, to be fair to Bill Clinton, that's something he tried to start. He started down that road. He just wasn't able to get there. And I think Barack Obama is his true successor, even if Bill Clinton himself has been unable to see that and accept that. I can't resist one sentence in response to the same question. Um, I, I mean, I hope that he's right about all of that. I do think there is, 
even if you're right, or maybe especially if you're right, there's a particular form in which racial politics will be extremely poisonous. In some ways, even assuming, or maybe especially assuming the success that you're describing, which is there's going to be an interaction of race, class, and gender in cities, which is to say that there's going to be a relatively, we hope, very small fraction of the black population, perhaps 10% of the black population, who are going to be disproportionately male, although also unwed mothers, so there's a different kind of gender story, who are very poor and who are going to get left out of the story. And so that we're going to see a much more complicated racial politics that's possible. The, the majority of non-Anglos, of people of color, will probably benefit under the best scenario that you're describing, and, but a non-trivial minority are going to be deeply, deeply, perhaps even more badly off than they are now. Uh, for a company. More badly off? I don't know. Maybe it's hard to be more badly off. Well, why would they jump at it? Uh, it's partly <laughs> hard to be more badly off. Um, because of the, see this last sentence, because the race problem in the United States has been solved. We've elected a black president. We've taken Obama, care of the. Obama's very concerned about. Yeah. He very I, oh, okay. I didn't I mean, mean it. A, I actually I, didn't I just mean think it. A, it could play out in a way that's actually benefits many and harms a few. That's I didn't I actually mean it that way. I, I think that the way in which conservatives are going to say the race problem has been solved has been to critique affirmative action policies, which have been pro middle class. They're not right. for the urban poor. Absolutely. Now, you know, look. There are urban poor issues, and Obama, an Obama and Democratic uh, regime is going to have to find a way to deliver some place-based improvements. We hope. But that's as that's true really for true. rural Maine and, um, you know, uh, white areas of Appalachia as it is for, you know, the Clinton Economics, which says, you know, slightly adjust the way Robert Rubenman operates so that that is not going to deliver place-based benefits. So one of their policy challenges is going to be to find a way to, to follow macro policies that are, you know, free trade oriented with some adjustments, et cetera, reviving the macro economy, but they're going to have to deliver jobs to some of these areas. And I don't know if they're going to be able to do that. Um, and, but I, I think they'll do it in the, in the context of trying to do it to all the poor areas, not just to urban poor. Just if I can add briefly on this, I don't think the ordinary citizen's sense of all this is going to turn out to depend all that much on the precise details of where benefits do or go, don't get channeled. It'll depend in significant part on how Obama handles himself in office and whether he has the same kind of reassuring presentation of himself that we've seen during the campaign and that seems to have reassured a lot of white voters uh, through the debates, for example. Um, and it'll depend a lot on how things actually go. I think it was a Chris Rock who said, George Bush has screwed things up so much that a white guy can't get elected in this country anymore. <laughs> um, it's, you know, you can imagine it four years from now, somebody saying that Obama has screwed things up so much given the, the state of the world and the state of the country that a black guy can't get elected anymore. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, a lot of what happens is not under the control mm -hmm. of these leaders. That's right. Really is not. right. You Identify Bernard, yourself, please. Bernard Fraga, Governor of Social Policy. Um, Thank you. I was wondering what happens if McCain wins? What happens to the Democrats if McCain wins? This grand coalition we've been talking about. That's a good question. Good question. I, think <laughs> if, I think if McCain wins, which, you know, uh, would, would be a squeaker, and, uh, and probably without a popular vote majority, um, I think that there will be um, a lot of anger, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that's not to say that you know the show will have to go on, and McCain will betray the Republican Party completely in the process of trying to deal with the situation. So both parties will be finding themselves in a soul-searching mode uh, along the lines of their internal divisions. Uh, Leaving aside the political finger-pointing, I think the most important outcome would be that the country would be ungovernable. I mean, for all McCain's talk about building bridges across the aisle, if you try and imagine where uh, President McCain is going to drum up congressional support to do anything, it's just impossible to imagine.
Um, I think this is something that he seems to care deeply about and will try to make progress on. I don't think it will be pitched primarily as an issue of inequality, but rather as an issue of opportunity and economic competitiveness for everybody. Yeah, now, I mean, we, we need to make a distinction between K through 12 and, and university access policy. And I just published a piece in Democracy Magazine about the college access issue. And, you know, Obama has been quite specific. He has ideas about increasing the financing for low and middle income that, in a way that will make more of a difference for low and middle income students and marrying that to some, some kind of civic or service uh, thing. And I think he will carry forward with that. But he will present it both as an opportunity and as an economic efficiency uh, move as, as well as, as, well, spreading opportunity is the way they're going to talk about inequality. I mean, he's not going to, actually it's been surprising to me how much he has talked about inequality. But I think he'll mainly talk about it as spreading opportunity. On the other hand, I expect him to do quite a lot of, you know, chest bumping about parental responsibility and about uh, the need for reform in the schools, that's not really something where the federal government can do a great deal directly. But he'll keep talking about that. And I think that they will, those are, are relatively less expensive areas where they can make a difference. And I think they'll carry forward with those. The big question is what he does in health policy. Because that could cost real money. And uh, I think the, the fascinating thing will be to see whether they move forward with that in the first year or try to hold it back. Uh, if they hold it back, they may never get to it. Um, and so uh, I think that's, I just don't know the answer. And you could, you could talk about that either way. But that's an, another issue that's both an equality issue and an efficiency issue. Um, You're next, then. Sorry. <laughs> I, you're directly behind each other, so. Danny, go ahead. Always behind me. <laughs> <laughs> I've always been behind you, Sid. <laughs> All right. There's Professor, no row up there. <laughs> so much. I will Professor Jenks and then Professor Verbo. So. This is a question for Larry. You talked about Sorry. how the Democrats <laughs> gave out the goodies in the second year and the Republicans got to give out the goodies in the fourth year. Yeah. Um, for these people that I was talking about at the 20th percentile, working poor people, the partisan difference in the minimum wage and how it's gone up and down accounts for a substantial chunk, in fact, maybe uh, for all of the difference at that income level. For the more middle income people, I think it's a combination of lots of other policies. But these tax policies, I think, are important in ways that get captured in measures of pre-tax income. It occurred to me after I sat down that I told you the McCain half of the tax story, but not the Obama half. He had a tax proposal last week as well, right? What kind of tax breaks did he want to give? Well, he wanted to give tax breaks to companies that hired new employees. They get a tax credit for each new employee they hired. In now, the United States. Right. So that's a tax break to the companies, but the way it's going to show up for ordinary people is that there are going to be more and better jobs than there would be otherwise. And so that's an example of the kind of thing that I think produces these effects on pre-tax as well as post-tax income. In terms of the political timing of it, I don't think that the Republicans are smarter than the Democrats or more political than the Democrats or something like that. But the important difference here is in what it is that they're trying to accomplish when they first come in and have the political opportunity to exercise their ideological convictions, which 
new administrations do really in the first year when they come in more than any other time. What Democrats want to do is to stimulate things and increase employment and, and so on. And so you get a, typically a big boom in the second year and then it's trailing off by the time the next election comes around. Could they just hold back for a couple of years and then produce the big boom? Well, probably not because politically it's much more difficult to do that as a third year president than it is to do as a new first year president with a new honeymoon having just been elected or, or reelected. Republicans, on the other hand, typically when they come in, they want to put the brakes on. There's often a recession or a significant slowdown in economic growth in the second year of a Republican administration. And then you're kind of growing out of that as the next election comes along. So what it is that they want to accomplish makes it easier for them to fit the rhythm of the election cycle uh, better than Democrats do. I think that's really the difference. Now, Professor Burke. I mean, I alluded to it in my remarks. I, the reason I think this is possibly, I want to underline possibly, a transformational election is in significant part because something different is happening with younger people in their engagement and attention and if they turn out to vote. I mean, that certainly was true in the Democratic primaries and it looks to be true in the general from what we can see of early voting. Um, and I think, I mean, Larry will know more than I, but I think that's one of the things you see when a transformational election is occurring in America, is there's a generational shift uh, in levels of participation and orientation. And probably, you're right, age is probably the sharpest divide, except apart from black, white, race. Yeah, uh, the not only the level of interest in apparent activism, or at least so far activism among young people, it's very striking, but also the democratic margin of support is really striking. And I think of it as being a sort of perfect storm of three different factors. One is the generational identities of the candidates themselves. On one hand, you have a kind of young Kennedy-esque Democrat, and on the other hand, a kind of Reagan-esque Republican who reminds these kids of their grumpy grandfathers. Um, and who played his role perfectly. Yeah. Um, but he's got okay. Secondly, you have the internet, new technology, the kind of cultural relaxation of younger people 
with respect to these complicated issues of race and identity that Theda talked about in her remarks. And third, you have uh, a kind of exaggerated version of what's a very common pattern, which is that young people don't have much political memory. And so whereas older voters tend to be averaging in their minds over the successes and failures that they've seen from both parties over a long period of time, the only thing these kids have seen of American politics is what's happened under George W. Bush. And that pushes them very clearly, strongly in one direction rather than another. So just as young people during the Reagan era, era were heavily Republican, uh, young people during previous eras of democratic uh, success have been disproportionately democratic. These young people have been imprinted with a strong democratic brand loyalty, which uh, the Democrats and Obama now have the opportunity to build upon going forward. Whether they'll succeed in that, we'll have to see. We're going to take one more question, but before we do that, uh, I want to ask either of you if you want to speak to the other issue Professor Gerber raised, which is foreign policy questions. Do you want to say anything about that? Either? I think this is the, part of the reason that this election has the, all, all that ever happens in politics is the potential for big transformation. And that carries with it, as Professor Verba so um, appropriately summarized, the risk of messing up big time. So that risk is definitely there. But um, part of the reason that this is potentially transformational is that it could marry a change in the way the United States relates to the rest of the world with a domestic change. And there, again, Obama is really an important figure uh, because, of, um, this is, this is the, because of the way the rest of the world looks at him. And I think it's pretty clear that they look at him as somebody who may change from sort of my way or the highway to a more cooperative form of asserting American leadership. Except in Afghanistan. Yeah, but the Afghans are, they don't care. I mean, they're, 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 they've never... Uh, or they don't count. They've right? never <laughs> really uh, accepted imperial control, and they're not going to now. And if <laughs> Obama gets heavily involved in Afghanistan, God help him. Um, and that's all I can say. <laughs> he needs to watch uh, that old Rudyard Kipling movie uh, before <laughs> he, he does that. But that, that, that's neither here nor there. I mean, the other thing that Obama symbolizes is a positive way of thinking about opportunity in America, which I don't think we should underestimate. I mean, the United States is a nation of immigrants, once again. And the idea that this is a place where somebody can come and rise that far, even with a funny name, uh, and, a, and, a, and a foreign father, that is electrifying to the rest of the world. So he has the opportunity to reset the United States' image, uh, and probably just by getting elected, he will open that particular door. I think I agree with all of that. I mean, to think about the implications of this for the party system or vice versa, foreign policy, even more than most issues, uh, cuts across party lines, and that's been true within the Republican Party and within the Democratic Party. All of that was put on hold by Iraq and Bush's policies around the world in, in connection with the war on terror. But I think it's likely that going forward, there are going to be debates within both parties about what appropriate foreign policies look like. Um, and even more than most policies, it's very hard to get at these in the course of a political campaign. So if you watch the debate carefully, probably the only thing that you really know about Obama's foreign policy is that he wants to negotiate with people without preconditions. But um, the actual issues that are going to arise in the field of foreign policy are going to be much more complicated than that. And they're going to create divisions within the foreign policy establishment within the Democratic Party. And I don't know how those will, kinds of debates will turn out. I think that Obama has had a lot of tacit support from Republican realists throughout this campaign. And, you know, you, Obama, uh, Colin Powell's endorsement was a symbol of that. And I think he will probably put together a surprisingly eclectic and fairly moderate foreign policy that will attempt to recreate, under new circumstances, uh, the post war bipartisan um, early consensus. Just to underline the uncertainty about how things will go in this realm, in 2000, George Bush was adamantly opposed to nation building. Yeah. 
and even people who opposed his policies on all sorts of other dimensions said at least he was going to have the grown-ups making foreign policy for him. <laughs> yeah, the the people that. from the old Bush administration, those guys like Cheney and Rumsfeld, who we all could have confidence in. <laughs> Final question. Um, you know, I'm an old New Deal liberal. You run deficits, which is going to be a very good thing to yeah, do, do uh, for the next uh, several years. But uh, look, I mean, I don't want to overestimate it. I actually think the way Obama's going to go about health policy, if he does go forward, is not as expensive as some possible alternatives. Now, I don't completely uh, buy the propaganda that's being put out by Kathy and our friends about saving $2,500 per person and all that. But, you know, think about the fact that this is a candidate who's actually consistently run from office saying that he's going to raise taxes on most of the professors in this room. I mean, he's said that. He's not flinched one inch. So he has never, ever, ever, ever said that he isn't going to raise revenue. He has said so. Um, now, I think that that's where some of the imponderables of how quickly he can pull back from Iraq and the amount of spending there and how much it costs to kind of do the stimulus and all the things to deal with the economic crisis. But if he does move forward with health care, I think he's, he's got a wrap that he's already put out there that will enable him to inject some revenues into the system. And as somebody who studied health care reform, and other people can dissent from this, I think there's absolutely only one thing you ever have to look at. Throw out all that stuff about the details of their plans. You know, health care plans come and go. They are all very long. There's only one question that ever matters. Are they prepared to put public revenue into it? And Obama has at least consistently said he is, and that he has some idea about where he might get it. How it I've paid attention to the history of America in the last three weeks, and the note that I made that I'm going to put under my pillow and pull out for future use is when people tell you we don't have the money to do this, remember that we found a trillion dollars pretty quickly when we needed it. And on that word, I want to thank our panelists for a wonderful discussion. Hope or pray, depending on our proclivities, that we find another trillion dollars pretty quickly. So, thank you all for coming.